what I want to do tonight is talk about Australian caves and karst. And so there's a big variety here, and uh, my interest really is landscape evolution. So what I've done is I've picked four of the areas of caves and karst in Australia that I'm most familiar with. And I'm going to go through those in a bit of detail, hopefully impress you with some nice photos, and talk about the landscape evolution. And then if there's time at the end, I'll tell you a few little anecdotes about my time as a caver and things that went right and other things that perhaps didn't go quite so well. So um, this is a map of the caving er karst areas in Australia. So in blue are the areas of Neo-Proterozoic and Paleozoic limestone and dolomite. And in orange are the areas of tertiary and quaternary limestone and dolomite. Um, you can see there's a lot of different areas. Uh, yes. Um, the ones I'm going to concentrate on are the Nullarbor in here, um, Mount Gambia just down here, Buchan over here, and Chiligo, this one up here. And um, just pointing out the distribution here, so the eastern Paleozoic and um, Neo-Proterozoic limestones are mostly quite heavily deformed. Um, you'll see the Chiligo ones are more or less vertical. Up in the northwest, there's some equivalent age carbonates that are more or less flat lying, and so they have a somewhat different um, cast development. Um, the tertiary and quaternary limestones are all pretty much flat lying, and the quaternary ones are basically dune systems uh, along the west coast of South Australia um, through um, West Australia, sorry, through South Australia here, and along the Victorian coast here and Tasmanian islands. Um, but what I want to do is talk about those different areas that I mentioned, the four of them, and talk about how they developed. So let's start with the Nullarbor. So the Nullarbor is very, very flat. And it's very, very flat because it used to be the bottom of the sea. So what you're basically looking at there is the sea floor. Um, it's been a bit eroded since then, but that's the reason that it's so flat. Um, it has the longest stretch of straight railway in the world, 478 kilometres and also some very long stretches of straight road. Um, there's a bit of wildlife, but the easiest way to photograph the wildlife is to photograph the signs on the road. <laughs> and um, you may or may not realise that um, part of the wildlife on the Nullarbor are wombats. The Nullarbor was the site of some nuclear testing in the late 50s and early 60s at Maralinga, and the consequences of that live on in that area. But basically, um, so this is a digital elevation model, three-dimensional model of the area. It's basically a big, flat, slightly elevated plain. Along the southern coast uh, is an extensive cliff line that is, in fact, the longest continuous cliff line in the world. Mm. It's not broken by rivers anywhere. Um, in the past, when the climate was wetter, um, there was enough rain falling there to generate river valleys, but what happened is the river valleys sank into the carbonate into cave systems. And so the cliff line is continuous. Um, here we have the Roe Plain at the foot of the cliffs. And down here, there's another small plain, the Israelite Plain. The surface isn't completely flat. It has these low undulations. And when you look at the low undulations in a good um, digital elevation model, you can see these ridges are more or less straight. And you can see that sometimes, as you trace them along, two of them join together into one. So this is a satellite image of exactly the same area. We can see these two ridges joining into one. And this is a cross section where we can see two ridges becoming one. What we think these are are etched remnants of dune fields that used to cover the Nullarbor. The dune sand itself is largely blown away, but these etched remnants live, leave, <coughs> are left behind. And when you trace them out, um, they vary in orientation from more or less north-south across to more northeast, and then curve around here. And we think that actually marks the previous wind directions that deposited those dunes. The cliff lines, as I said, um, extend unbroken for hundreds of kilometres. Where Oh, and this is um, a drone shot looking vertically downwards at the cliffs. Um, what we see here are a group of cavers who've attached a rope to their car and are abseiling over the edge looking for caves in the cliffs. And um, 
I haven't done this, but I spoke to them and they told me one of the things they had to take into account was the onshore winds, um, because the waves breaking on the foot of the cliffs here can actually send spray two thirds of the way up and they can get a serious drenching while they're um, abseiling down the cliff. Um, this is the row plane. Here's a more degraded cliff line going up to the slightly elevated plateau on top. The geology is very simple. It's um, basically a series of different limestone units. The early one, the Milson Bluff limestone, was deposited. Then the sea withdrew and then came back again and deposited these thinner limestones on top and then withdrew completely. And so the limestones are basically stacked on top of each other. Exploration on the Nullarbor has recently involved light aircraft, including ultralights, can cover large areas and look for cave entrances that people haven't been able to find previously. And when we do that, we see that there's a lot more cave entrances than were previously known. So all the biggest caves in the Nullarbor are close to the coast um, through here. Um, inland is this belt of caves through here that are smaller. And so first of all, I just want to look at the main caves in the Nullarbor through this area here. So most of them are entered through surface collapses where the cave has collapsed right through to the surface. Um, so in this case, um, there's a car over here for scale. Some of the holes you go into are smaller. So this is the entrance to a cave called Tampana. And this is looking out of one of those collapses. Um, you can see the ladder here that they used to get in and there's also a rope over here. These caves close to the coast are mostly pretty simple. Um, so they're basically long tubes. Um, sometimes they branch, sometimes they have uh, more complicated extensions. Um, we can see from the scale here that they can be quite long, but a lot of them are relatively short. This is um, one of the bigger ones. This is Abra Curry. And um, it's basically a huge elongate chamber. Um, one of the things about the shape of the chamber is this curved shape here is due to collapse. It's not so obvious here because most of the collapsed material is buried under the sediment here. But in others, we can see clearly that there's a lot of collapse in the chamber and it's collapsed up to a bedding plane here. Within the chambers, you can have sand dunes. So the sand dunes here are due to disaggregation of the limestone. So um, salt weathering of the limestone forces the grains apart and the limestone is basically sand sized material cemented together. Those sand grains accumulate on the floor and some of the caves actually have reasonable um, drafts blowing through them that blows them into dunes. But uh, the Nullarbor caves are really renowned for the water. So many of them have lakes. And the lakes are this beautiful, clear, blue-green water, um, extremely salty. And this has attracted cave divers. So the Nullarbor is one of the cave diving destinations of the world. Um, so I'm not a cave diver, um, but I appreciate it. And so one of the caves here has passage over six kilometres long. It's not six kilometres of con continuous diving. There's some airfield chambers along the way, but it's been explored for that length. And um, there's actually a little story. So cave divers like to dive in caves and go as far as possible. And so an Australian expedition pushed this cave um, over six kilometres and then they went away and a French expedition came in and went in the same cave and pushed it about 200 metres further to, yeah. to get the world record. And then the Australians had to go back and push it just that little bit further to get the record back. Um, for these large distances, they use quite sophisticated um, scooter and multi-tank combinations. And in some places we can see, rather than being a collapsed cave like the previous ones, now we see a smoothly rounded roof here with a sand dune on the floor indicating we're in the original solutional passage. So um, 
this is a long section through a couple of the caves. You can see they go down quite deep. Um, many of them are well over 100 metres below the surface. And they're basically a long passage with a series of collapsed chambers. So this is Cunalda, and down here we have Panic and Plain. And you can see some of them go through um, a long diving section and then come out into airfield chambers. So, um, as I said, it's a cave diving mecca. In the water, there are some unusual um, things. So, um, when this photo was taken, um, you can't see a scale on it because no diver was going to go close enough. So, the scale of a diver is about that big there. No, I'm lying. They're, <laughs> um, they're tiny. You have to look really carefully to see them. Um, they're a microbial um, um, thing. Um, they actually precipitate small amounts of calcite, and so underneath them, there's um, like snowflakes of calcite on the cave floor. In the upper level caves um, that aren't full of water, there's um, stalactites and stalagmites. Um, person here for scale, um, but they're dead. They're not um, functional under the present climate. And they're being broken down to varying degrees by the amount of salt that's in the caves. But uh, one of the interesting things about them is the colour. So they're typically quite dark brown or almost black in colour. And this is due to organic material that's been incorporated in the calcite. Um, these have now been dated um, by a group at Melbourne Uni, led by John Woodhead. And um, using uranium lead dating, some of these um, black calcites go back um, nearly 8 million years. And uh, we can use that to give us insights into the cave development. Um, what is precipitating in the caves now, because the water seeping in is so saline under the very arid climate, um, are two minerals, gypsum and halite. Halite is just rock salt. So these are gypsum deposits. And these are halite rock salt. And we also get stalactites of halite. Um, this one's being partially dissolved by the water that's coming down at the moment. Also in the caves are bone deposits. So this is an almost complete skeleton of Thylacoleo, um, the so-called marsupial lion. And um, there have been quite a variety of fossils excavated from the caves. Um, these animals lived when the Nullarbor was covered in woodland under a much wetter climate than is present at the moment. And at the same time as the calcite was being deposited with all that organic material. And the organic material in the calcite seems to be coming from swamps on the surface at the time. So um, how did the Nullarbor Caves form? How old are they? Um, are they still forming? What's going on there? So the black dots here are the main deep Nullarbor Caves close to the coast. And if you draw a section through them, which I've got here, and the lines here just indicate the depth of the cave. Um, they're not an indication that it's a vertical shaft. But we can see they go down to substantial depths. The, white, the blue line there is the current um, water depth in the caves. And almost all these caves are dominated by collapse. So the cave passage that we see is not the original cave passage that formed. Um, the original cave passage was underneath this. And it was full of water. And then the water drained out of it and removed the buoyant support for the cave roof and it collapsed and started to stope upwards towards the surface and eventually got to the surface and formed those circular holes that we saw that we can now climb in and explore the caves. So the original caves were down deep uh, in this area down here and we think it's most likely that they formed after this original limestone, the Wilson Bluff limestone, was deposited when the sea withdrew. So the sea withdrew for um, around five to 10 million years at that stage, and the water level dropped, and there was potential for caves to form. Then the sea rose again and deposited these extra limestones over the top. And that um, fall in sea level, the rise in sea level, and the resultant fall um, allowed for these to collapse and then stope their way upwards. So we think the deep caves formed quite early. Um, 
When you go north on the Nullarbor Plain, there are some caves there that are not full of collapse. So um, this is a cave system where we can see a more rounded shape to it and it's dissolved a um, joint in the cave roof. And so this is what we call the original phreatic passage. So originally this would have been full of water. Um, it hasn't collapsed in this case, um, presumably because it's relatively small compared to the other caves which would have been much bigger. So this one is to the north of those. Um, when we look at the shape of it, it's overall a single passage with some branches, but it has quite a lot of complexity. And where we look at the location of this, um, it's located near some stream valleys that come off the hills to the north. I'm not very clear on this image here. So these, the water comes out of these stream valleys, sinks into the limestone, dissolves the cave passage, but then goes through the limestone and eventually comes out as a spring at the coast. And as it goes further south, it gathers more water and becomes larger. And so these caves closer to the coast are the deepest and the largest. Um, but I mentioned before these um, multitudinous caves to the north, these are much smaller. So these are typically called blowholes. <laughs> and they're called blowholes because um, put a hanky over it and the air blows out of them. So the air either sucks in or blows out depending on the air pressure above them. So when the air pressure is low, the air comes gushing out of them. When the air pressure is high, it's forced into them. Um, when you climb into them, they just don't go anywhere. Um, not very far. They're tiny, they're interconnected. Um, there's a lot of cave volume in there, but only as small passages. And um, you can see they're interconnected here. That's, that's me. Um, these, we think, formed along a previous shoreline. So when the sea advanced across the Nullarbor Plain and deposited the limestone, as it retreated, the shoreline stayed here for a considerable period of time. And where you get mixing of freshwater and seawater at the shoreline, you get enhanced dissolution of the limestone. And so we think that dissolved these small caves over this large area at that time, and then the sea retreated further and they were drained. Um, there's a third area of caves on the Nullarbor, um, and that's some caves on the Roe Plain down here. So these caves are close to sea level, and they're basically all flooded. So um, this is one of them here, that's the entrance up there, and the rest of it is completely full of water. Um, these can be only explored by divers. And um, the thing about these is the water is extremely salty and it also has some unusual characteristics. So it has a greenish tint to it. Um, there's a diver over here for scale. And uh, what we're looking at here is tree roots. So the water is really, really salty, too salty for trees to use. But when it rains, the rain seeps through the overlying limestone and it forms a very thin layer of fresh water across the top of that salty water. And the trees want that. So they send down their roots and their root mats just grow along the top of the salt water in that fresh layer and suck it up. Um, what's happened here is as the divers go through, their bubbles go up and they disturb the tree roots and some of them collapse down into the water. Um, and that's what's causing that there. But um, these caves are so close to sea level and so extensive um, that if sea level dropped and they were drained, they would all collapse. Um, many of them have only got two metres or less of um, rock over the roof of the cave. And so what that means is they can only have formed since sea level is at its present elevation. And sea level reached its present elevation around 8,000 years ago. So these caves, in contrast to the others on the Nullarbor, appear to be quite recent, and they're probably still forming at the moment. The other caves are much older. So just to recap, the deep caves close to the coast uh, collapse and we think they formed during the Oligocene low sea level. And the shallower inland phreatic caves that I showed may have formed at the same time. The blowholes um, formed later than that, probably in the mid-Miocene when there was a, a still stand in the sea level. And the dates that we get on the speleothems, the stalactites within the caves, get younger towards the coast, indicating progressive 
um, retreat of the sea level of the sea towards the current coast. The black calcite decoration is mostly dated to 3.5 to 5 million years ago, indicating a warm, wet climate on the Nullarbor at that time when animals like Thylacoleo were roaming the forests or the woodland. Currently, it's very arid and we just get gypsum and halite and salty groundwater. And the only active cave dissolution at the moment, we think, is the flooded caves on the Rope Plain. So, let's go on and talk about something completely different. So this is Mount Gambia here and Portland here in southeastern South Australia and far western Victoria. Um, that line there marks the inland extent of the limestone. So this whole area here is underlain by limestone. And these lines that we see over here are beach ridges that are also um, limestone, basically. What we're going to do is have a close look at this area south of Mount Gambier, basically. And in this area, there are a series of caves which are generally called cenotes. Um, this is a cross section through it. We see the limestone here. The caves extend vertically um, some considerable distance and they're basically collapse chambers. So they're a huge collapse that's extended towards the surface and they're now full of water. So that's the current water level through there. So these are water filled caves. Surface of the limestone looks like that quite thin soils. Uh, in other places, the soils are good enough to support pretty extensive dairying industry in this area. But then we have the cenotes. And so this is one here, this is one tree, and um, it just goes down very steeply. So I had permission to snorkel in this one, and over just where I took the photograph from, there's a vertical wall of limestone that extends down 30 metres. And you can snorkel, um, I can duck dive down 15, maybe 20 metres on a big breath. And as you duck dive down, you just go down this vertical wall of limestone and the, the water's totally clear. And then you get as far as you can, you run out of breath. And as you go up, you can put your arms out and spiral upwards and pretend that you're flying because the water's so clear. It's just magic. Over in the background is Mount Shank, which is probably the most recent volcanic eruption in Australia about five to 6,000 years ago. This is another one of the cenotes. This is Black's. Um, we can see in here the lake, and underneath that is a big collapsed dome. This is one of the biggest. It's the shaft. It's got a very tiny entrance at the top, and this is just a huge pile of collapsed rubble. So all of these are just basically water-filled collapse chambers. They don't go anywhere. They don't connect to any other cave. They're just single caves like this. And um, this is another diving mecca. So you can, um, if you're a diver, get shots like this. Um, the water is so clear. Um, cave divers require special qualifications, um, which I don't have. And in this area, um, a number of people have died in the caves. In the shaft, for example, the one I just had the map of, um, I think three or maybe four people have died in that. Um, other caves are smaller and you can see actual passages. You can see the rounded nature here of the passage. So this one is not a collapsed chamber, but most of the others are. Some other caves in there show this very dense um, reticulated pattern of passages that are formed parallel to the major joint direction in the limestone. Some of the caves there actually extend underneath Mount Gambier. So this is central Mount Gambier, the cave entrance here, and extends underneath these houses here. And I'm sure they're completely unaware of that. Yeah. So how did these caves form? They're really unusual. Um, and we think they formed um, due to release of carbon dioxide at depth. And the carbon dioxide has come up and it's dissolved out big chambers at depth and then those chambers have collapsed. So why do we think that? Well, one of the reasons we think that is um, this is a photograph of some infrastructure near a well in South Australia called Carolyn One. And this was drilled looking for gas. And what they struck was a big carbon dioxide reservoir. So they pump the carbon dioxide to the surface and they sell it. So 
A lot of people are surprised by that, but we use lots of carbon dioxide. Fizzy drinks require carbon dioxide. You can make money out of selling pure carbon dioxide, and they do. And um, the analyses on that carbon dioxide show that it's associated with volcanic eruptions. So the second most common gas that comes out of volcanic eruptions is carbon dioxide. The most common is water. And so there's lots of carbon dioxide associated with volcanic eruptions, and what we seem to be seeing here is an input of carbon dioxide that came up and dissolved these big chambers at the base of the limestone that then collapsed and formed these cenotes. Within the cenotes are stromatolites. So everyone thinks of Shark Bay as the area where stromatolites grow, but the biggest and best stromatolites, in my opinion, are growing in these cenotes. Um, so this is one, so we had a special permit um, to collect this one and um, actually hired some divers to dive down and they were meant to cut it off at the base with an underwater chainsaw. And they told us afterwards that um, even though the water's very clear, once they started using the chainsaw, it churned up the water and there was a lot of silt that had settled on the stromatolite and pretty soon they couldn't see anything. And so the guy there said, I couldn't work out what was going on. I just had the chainsaw in front of me. It was sort of bouncing around, couldn't see a thing, a bit worried about cutting myself. So they came to the surface and they went, we can't cut it. Um, it's too tough. And so what we did was we get the, got the crane driver to just take up the tension and he snapped it off. And then we hauled it out and looked at it closely. And would you believe it, we'd got it when it was flowering. Um, so that's just a, a lilo underneath it there. Um, so stratolites are formed by blue-green algae and um, this one has been passed on to some people who are working on the actual um, cyanobacteria. But what we, what we did was date it. And the age at the bottom is about 8,000 years. And so this stromatolite started growing when sea level had risen enough to flood the cenotes and allow them to form underwater. There's also um, fossils in some of these. This is out of Green Waterhole Cave. Um, once again, some of the megafauna. And just in passing, a nearby cave at Naracourt, um, lots of nice stalactites, but um, you'll notice I haven't showed you many photos of stalactites so far because if you're looking at landscape evolution, stalactites just get in the way. Mm. They obscure the shape of the cave. They're just annoying. Um, so I try to ignore them. Um, Naracourt's famous for the bone deposits on the floor of the passages and um, they've been used to reconstruct skeletons. This is once again a thylacoleo skeleton. Naracourt's also well known as a nursery site for many opterists. So the cenotes, collapsed chambers, um, I didn't mention it before, but they lie along the intersections between the dominant, do dominant, dominant joint directions. The caves that formed them were really large, in some cases more than a million cubic metres, and we think they were dissolved by groundwater acidified by the volcanogenic carbon dioxide rising up from depth. And so cave dissolution probably occurred during some of the volcanic eruptions in that area. There have been two series of volcanic eruptions there, the Mount Burr eruptions over a million years ago and the Mount Gambier shank eruptions uh, 30,000 years ago and then again 5,000 years ago. So they were completely different, but let's go on and look at another different area. So this is Bakken in East Gippsland. And uh, what we see here is an area of limestone in blue and another limestone area here and overlain by this grey mile unit. Two caving areas here that I'm going to talk about, the tourist cave system down here. So if you've been to Bakken and you've been in the caves there, you've been to the tourist caves here. And another area up here called the potholes. So the limestone forms these nice cliffs along the river and overlying it up here in the grass is the marl over the top. Cave passages um, have typical phreatic shapes, often um, oriented along joints and um, these rounded shapes typical of caves forming underwater phreatic caves. Um, associated with them are some quite large springs. This is a spring coming out into the Murrindal River. And this spring here actually comes out of the tourist cave system 
and has been used to fill the swimming pool. Unfortunately, you can't swim in the swimming pool anymore. They've emptied it. And um, when I was there last time, I looked at the sign and it said that there's a regulation that if you have a pool like that that's being filled by a spring, you have to fill the entire volume of the pool four times in an hour. Um, I guess that's to make sure there's no bacteria building up or anything like that. And the flow in this one's not enough for that. And so they're not allowed to let anyone swim in it. Having said all that, um, the water's freezing. Um. <laughs> Within the tourist caves, if you've been there, um, quite well decorated, but like I said, who cares about stale? It's just in the way. Um, the important thing here is the flat roof. So the flat roof indicates that um, the water rose to that level and stayed there for a while and dissolved this cave passage. And there are a series of flat roofs in the caves. Um, there's three, one down here, one up here, and an intermediate one in a different passage here. And when we look at the nearby um, Murrindal Valley, what we see are some steps in the actual floor of the valley and the spacing of the steps matches the spacing of these cave levels. And it also matches um, the river terraces along the Bakken. So what we see here is the river stopped at a particular level, formed a terrace, eroded a cave level, then dropped down, um, eroded a nick point in the Murrindal, formed another terrace, formed another cave level, and then dropped down again. And so that's probably episodic tectonic activity. Um, so, um, People often think of Australia as being an old, dull, boring continent, um, but Victoria is definitely not. So the landscape in Victoria has changed beyond all recognition in the last 10 million years, and this is part of that, this tectonic uplift that we can see here. Now, if we go to the northern area at Buchan, this is the area called the potholes, and it's called the potholes because of all these holes across the landscape. Um, each one of these basically represents a collapse into a cave underneath. And there are actually even more than you can see there if we look at the LIDAR. So it's like a Swiss cheese. And it's very unusual to get such a concentration of cave development over such a small area like that. So there's something interesting going on at Buchan here. When we look at the caves themselves, a lot of them are vertical. And we see the ladder coming down here. And the roof actually steps up in a series of steps as it goes up towards the entrance. Most of the caves are fairly simple, but um, this one, Exponential, is more extensive. Um, but it too has these quite vertical um, sections. At the base of these caves, um, not so much in this one, but in an adjacent one, um, it actually goes into a small stream passage. And that stream passage then connects through um, and the cave divers have been in there. So the cave diving here is really serious stuff. Um, it's not big passages like Mount Gambia or Nullarbor. This is tight, dirty, nasty stuff um, that I wouldn't contemplate going into myself. And the cave divers who do this are, in my opinion, completely mad. Um, but they do get to see things like this. So they broke through a whole series of sumps into this chamber here, which they call the Hall of the Crazy Horses. And um, I'll never get to see this, alas, but um, it's impressive. So why are the potholes where they are? So that's the potholes there. The blue is the limestone. And we can see this is an old river valley. And just here are river gravels from that old river valley. These are the river gravels. And we can construct from that where the river used to go, used to go through here. And that is, in fact, the ancestral Snowy. The Snowy itself has now been diverted to the east over here. And the caves formed underneath the Snowy River, the ancestral Snowy River, when it was flowing through there. So what we see is the potholes here. And you can see now the potholes are at the end of this limestone. So there's a little lens of limestone here that's overlain by mudstone, the Taravale Formation. And so the water underneath the river goes through and then comes up to the surface again. That's called a phreatic loop. That just occurs due to physics. And the concentrated area here was where the water was forced upwards because the limestone basically lensed out. So there's a major pathway forcing the water up there 
and we get that very significant cave development. Um, the ancestral river that flows down through here with the river gravels up here could have started forming as long ago as late Cretaceous, it's impossible to say. But um, the caves themselves when they were drained, so the thing about caves is when they're full of water, they're forming. Then the water level drops and they're drained, so now we can get into them and stalactites and stalagmites can form. And in the caves here, stalactites and stalagmites have been dated and they're as old as nearly three million years. And in the caves down here, which are basically at present river level or very close to it, the sediments there are 2.6 million years old and the stale is as old as 2.2 million years. So that incision had occurred by 2.6 million years ago. And it's probably related to the fact that in this area there was a major tectonic uplift around about 5 million years ago called the Kosciuszko uplift. So the Kosciuszko uplift um, was really significant. It doubled the height of the southern Alps, southeastern Alps. Um, and it occurred over a relatively short period of time, a few million years, give or take. And um, there's been smaller movements since then, but it's basically a major uplift that changed the appearance of the whole area. So the potholes were formed by this upward groundwater flow, concentrated where the Marundel limestone terminated. Um, they were drained by the Kosciuszko uplift and they were certainly empty caves by 3 million years ago and the lowest ones 2.6 million years ago. And um, once they were drained, water could go into them. So for ages we thought these were formed like water going down, but water going down now is just modifying caves that were originally formed by water going up. And the water going down now has dissolved a new cave system um, that <coughs> the cave divers have explored, as I said. The tourist cave system is a much more horizontal system. Um, it's got vertical parts that were probably drained at the same time as the potholes, but the horizontal system are formed due to these small episodic tectonic uplifts. The lowest level of the caves has stale that's nearly 900,000 years old, so it's been an enterable cave for probably at least a million years too. Okay, so the last area I want to talk about is Chiligo. So Chiligo is up in uh, northeastern Australia, um, there's Cairns and the area that I'm going to talk about is this area here. There's two areas of limestone here, one there and one to the north up here. They're adjacent to this major fault, the Palmerville Fault, and basically the limestone lenses here are more or less vertically dipping. And the, the lenses themselves are fault blocks, they've all been separated by faults. Um, this is a satellite image. The brown spots here are the limestone, we can see up here. And the grey is a combination of mudstones and cherts. Um, previous gold mine here. And this is perhaps a bit clearer in an air photo. So this is a bluff of limestone and separating it from the next bluff is a fault. And the bedding in these is more or less vertical. So these are called bluffs or towers, and they're spectacular. Um, so walking around on these is a nightmare. Um, uh, <clears throat> if you fall over, you'll hurt yourself, you'll, you'll cut things. And um, it slices up your boots just walking over them. And um, also the climate, so to go in winter, it's very pleasant, go in summer, um, it's putrid. It's really, really hot, really, really humid, and then the monsoon starts. Um, but the sp scenery is just great. I love it. And when you get close up, these little runnels here, which are called Rill and Karen, are just all razor sharp, and they just cover the limestone everywhere. So they're beautiful when you look at them, um, walking over them, not so much. The caves within the bluffs are big. Um, huge passages, um, often in a grid, um, following the joint directions, and lots of collapses forming big daylight chambers that you can walk around in. Um, some of the stalactites are really unusual, um, and they have these flat terminations that the locals call sucker pads. 
And um, it's not clear to me why these form. Um, they don't, the levels here don't line up. It's not a previous water level when the cave was flooded. Um, it's something physical about the way the water is trickling down these and then um, terminating. Um, the passages inside um, can often be really large. So um, years ago, I was doing some field work there with an honours student and we got into one of the caves and we weren't actually intending to go in the cave. In fact, what we were doing was looking at this here, which I'll talk about in a sec. But we're walking through this enormous chamber and uh, um, we didn't have lights, so we're just walking along, but it was big and there was daylight coming in in the distance. You could see where you were easily enough. I was walking along next to the student and suddenly there was a bong. I thought, what was that? And I looked around and the student was lying on the ground and it actually walked into a stalactite. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't hurt. Um, <laughs> Um, the walls of the cave um, are covered in fossils. So these limestones here are Siluro-Devonian, and these are enormous bivalves called megalodonts. Um, they're actually articulated in place. It's a storm bed um, where they're all buried by a storm deposit. Um, there's some big decoration within them in places, and once again, these enormous passages um, with daylight chambers periodically. Biologically, they're really interesting too. Swiftlets nest in the caves. Um, these swiftlets can fly in the dark. Um, when you're there and they fly past you, you can hear them clicking. And the click is um, their own sonar, radar. Um, it reflects off the walls and tells them where they are. Also, a uh, big variety of bat species there, including um, this one here, which is a type of flying fox. And it actually roosts on the vertical walls around some of the daylight holes, not actually in the darkness, um, but around the walls. And um, also the ghost bat, um, Macroderma gigas, um, lives there. Along the rivers, the turbulence of the water dissolves these ripple features in the limestone. Some of the towers have fallen over, so they've been there a while. Um, this shows the extent of some of the caves. So that line there is basically the edge of the bluff. And you can see it's basically honeycombed by this cave system. Um, the cave's development within the bluffs is very extensive. This is a cross section just illustrating what's going on. So the limestone is these sub-vertical um, beds that are often separated by faults. There's also chert layers here. And over the top here, we have some river sediments that are late Jurassic that have actually covered over some of these limestone pinnacles. So the limestone pinnacles we can see elsewhere were actually in existence before these late Jurassic sediments covered them. So this is a Google Earth image. There is the limestone pinnacle. And here it's been covered by late Jurassic sediments. So the tower cast itself is ancient. It's been there, it was there before the late Jurassic. And just to demonstrate again, um, we can see the late Jurassic sediments and the limestone rises above it, um, as does the chert. And in some cases, we can see the late Jurassic sediments on top of the chert. This one's interesting. So that's a cave, that's the limestone, there's the late Jurassic sediments. Um, they don't go into the cave. There's no evidence anywhere that these late Jurassic sediments, which buried the towers, actually infiltrated into the caves, even though the caves are full of daylight chambers, they could easily have been filled with the sediments. So the conclusion seems inescapable that the towers formed and the caves formed within the towers later, in fact, probably much later. And um, this puzzled me a lot until I looked at some data from a different area in Northern Australia at Bulleta, which is in um, the Northern Territory, subject to a similar climate. And what we see here in black is the caves. And as you trace the caves back underneath the overlying sediment here, so there's the limestone or dolomite overlying sediment, there's heaps of cave development out here where the limestone's exposed and nothing underneath here where it's covered by the sediment. So it's not until this sediment's eroded that the cave development starts to form. And in this area here, um, people have been here during the monsoon. And it seems that the monsoonal rainfall falling directly on top of the limestone 
is what's responsible for the cave development here. So in other cases, the caves form at depth in the limestone underneath the water table. But here they're forming above the water table due to that massive amount of water that comes in every monsoon wet season. So this is a really, really interesting area. The monsoonal cast of Australia is unique um, to see this. So we can say the tower cast at Chiligo is old. Um, it was probably formed in the early Mesozoic and buried by these river sediments in the late Jurassic. Um, the maze caves probably formed after the towers were exhumed by erosion and now exposed to the monsoon climate. And the monsoon climate, there are papers that say that became established around 30 to 40 million years ago. That's a bit controversial. Um, I don't have any evidence one way or the other. And so the cave development here occurs from the top down. Very unusual. Um, just so much runoff from the torrential downpours, more or less uniform dissolution over the entire tower, enlarging the joints and forming the maze caves. The overall denudation rate of the surface of the limestone is very low, 2 to 2.4 million metres per million years. So a British um, geomorphologist who went to Chiligo a while ago, um, very unkindly, in my opinion, called it a tower cast in decay. And I prefer to think of it as a tower cast in slow time. Okay, so um, they're the four areas I want to talk about. They're completely different. They formed in different ways. Um, they illustrate the diversity of cave development in Australia and the things we can find out about it in terms of landscape evolution. Um, but in my title, I said I'd talk a bit about risk. And so, um, I wanted to talk first about risks to caves. So caves have been abused in Australia. Um, they've had rubbish thrown in them. They've been mined. Um, so there's been extensive mining in a lot of Australian caves for guano, for fertiliser. Um, that went right through to the 1960s in some places. Um, fortunately, guano mining is no more. It wasn't a very good fertiliser anyway. And um, dumping rubbish in caves um, is basically a thing of the past as well, although we have to keep a watch. One of the big dangers um, to caves has been through quarrying. So limestone's a resource. We use limestone for cement. Huge amounts of limestone are quarried every year in Australia. And some of the limestone areas are cavernous. So this is Mount Etna, um, west of Rockhampton. And it was the site of a long-running conservation battle so most of the quarry area was in non-cavernous limestone, but it overlapped into some of the caves. And in fact, they broke into a cave on one of the lower benches that was completely unknown before um, resurrection. Um, the cavers tried to get the quarrying stopped. The quarry people became really hostile towards cavers. And in an act of, um, well, I won't, say how I describe it, but they blasted one of the caves deliberately and destroyed it. And it was a, a wintering site, uh, a roosting site for the ghost bat. And um, the most recent data seems to indicate the ghost bat numbers have never recovered from that. However, um, the quarry management changed and quarrying stopped and it's now being rehabilitated. And um, the new quarry management were in fact um, pretty cooperative, I have to say. So um, it was a bad story and it turned into a good story. The other risk to caves really now is that overuse. Um, so tourism development in caves is welcome, in my opinion. Um, it publicises caves. It's good for general public to see what caves are. Um, inevitably, building the pathways um, impacts the cave. Um, there are impacts associated with the amount of lint that comes in with people. Um, um, in very heavily used tourist caves, they have to be periodically washed down to remove the lint. And um, there are also problems with that when you accumulate the lint, if you just wash it into pools on the floor, um, because it has a lot of skin cells as well as um, bits of cotton off your clothing, it starts to de decay and can become a bit putrid. But um, there's an Australian Cave and Cast Management Association that's doing very good work to ensure that Australian caves are now as well managed as possible. 
and overuse is one of the things that they concentrate on. Okay, so what I thought I'd finish off with is, okay, I said I don't like pretty much um, decoration, stalactites, stalactites, but I'll show you a few photos just to indicate that I have an aesthetic side to my character. <laughs> um, so these are called helictites. They go in weird directions. Um, this is a straw. You can see the calcite crystals actually growing around the outside of the water drop. Uh, the one on the left is called an anthodite, and the one on the right is often called frostwork. Um, particularly the anthodites are often composed of aragonite rather than calcite. Um, here we have two people, and here. So this is in a cave in Tasmania called Kubla Khan, which you could probably imagine, I'd probably say is the best cave in Australia, I think. Um, it's a big cave, big chambers, big decoration. Um, so the decoration's so large that um, when you're in there by yourself or with your party, you've all got little headlamps, you can't really appreciate how big everything is. It's only when you see the photos later you go, wow. That was something. Um, these are called shawls, and uh, this is also in Kublai Khan. Um, this is formed by um, the droplets splashing as they come down and crystallizing. And so these are all pretty and nice. And so some people go into caves and look at the pretty stuff. But you can also do some pretty exciting stuff in caves. So this is a shaft in Tasmania called Midnight Hole. Um, that's a person there, and he's abseiling down this rope, um, down the shaft. And um, that particular shaft has fabulous acoustics. Um, from the bottom to the top, you can hear things as clear as a bell. Um, cave entrance in southwestern Tasmania. And the caves in Tasmania, Tasmania has high rainfall, it's pretty cold. Caves there are the, the toughest in Australia. Um, you really know you've been caving when you've been caving in Tasmania. Um, they're cold and wet, and you have to abseil down through the water in places. And um, this is uh, Mount Anne, which is in southwestern Tasmania, and the ridge here is composed of dolomite, and it has this enormous doline in it, which leads to a cave called Anacananda. A bit further down are uh, some other doline cave entrances, one of which is called Keller's Cellar. And this is a photo looking up Keller's Cellar, and that is a person. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I was putting these photos together, I looked at these, and I get an adrenaline buzz just looking at the photos. Because when you're at the top there, and you're ready to go down, the adrenaline is really pumping. Once you're on the rope, there's nothing you can do. Um, you just have to look after yourself the best you can. And um, so, for example, we went to a cave in New Zealand, which has a pitch about the size of the one we're looking at here. And I went down first and I was at the bottom um, helping to guide people coming down next. Um, and I looked at the next guy coming down. And because it's such a long pitch, we had a knot in the middle. And so you abseil down the rope and you get to the knot and you have to go through a complicated procedure to get over the knot and then keep going. And as he was going through this complicated procedure, I could see him up there. And suddenly something separated from him and came floating down like a big leaf. And it was his glove, because he would got so, when you're up in the, you know, 100, 200 feet off the ground, trying to work out what's going on, and he dropped his glove. But um, he worked out what to do and made it down safely. So that was a good story to end with. Um, if I could just talk for another couple of minutes. So I thought I'd finish off with just some stories, a story I'm going to tell you about my caving exploits. And so um, I did a lot of caving when I was younger. I'm not really up to it now, but uh, most of the time was good. But sometimes things you used to worry. So we did, went caving in northern New South Wales, an area called Timor. And um, we hadn't been there before, so we didn't really know where the caves went. And we we're walking across one of the chambers and there was a hole in the floor of the chamber, quite small, but clearly it had been dug out by somebody. And we thought, oh, let's have a look down that. So I went down and um, pretty soon it got very, very tight. So if you're in a tight section in a cave, you want to collapse your shoulders. So that's the widest part of your body. So the best way is to have both arms above your head. 
But um, if you want to go through easily, it helps a lot if you've got one arm down by your side because it helps you to push through. So I started going down in this and I had one arm down my side, by my side and I was pushing along through this passage and it started to get really tight. And I thought, oh, I need to get my arm up, but it was too tight. I couldn't get my arm up. And I kept going and um, it got so tight that every time I breathed in, I locked solid in the passage. And then I'd breathe out and push myself through a little bit and then breathe in and lock solid and breathe out and push through a little bit further. And eventually I got through to a bit where I could get, turn around <laughs> and go back out. Um, but I thought I'd just leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs> that was remarkable. And you've paid great tribute to Alfred Hart because you've included a lot of a bit of zoology and a bit of some sort of interesting animals and things. Um, when I was an undergrad and a bit after, I used to do a fair bit of scuba diving, and I cannot agree with you more. Cave divers are the nuttiest people on the planet. They, the, so I've been to the shaft, I was going to dive, and I chose not to <laughs> because it's just diabolical. But some other, but I have dived in Piccaninny ponds and a couple of the yeah. easy ones, and it's, I agree with you, it's just, it's a Quite an extraordinary yeah, experience. Now, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, what's the composition of the Nullarbor limestone? Because you were talking about sand dunes. So this is the, this is the, you know, the simple geomorphologist asking some dumb questions, which is probably a good thing for me to do. There's clearly an arenaceous, arenaceous fraction in the limestone. Yeah. So How it, much? Um, so it's mostly composed of sand-sized fragments of fossil material. Ah, I see, okay. Um, and there's a bit of quartz sand in there as well, but it's mostly sand-sized calcareous fragments. Hmm. And I was fascinated with the discussion about the Kosciuszko uplift that I used to just use to describe the reason that we've got silicious sand beaches on the east coast. I had no idea that it had such an impact yeah. underground. Yep. Enormous. Phenomenal. All right, now we've got time for all sorts of questions, and Mike's going to help me. It'll be questions from the audience first. And then there'll be questions that'll come to us from online, I'm sure, too, Mike, won't they? Uh, yeah, I think uh, so far we've just got feedback saying thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, but if there are questions here in the audience, just put your hand up and we'll certainly come to you with a microphone. I do have one myself to get us started. Um, yeah, I've um, done some exploration around Murrindal in particular. It's great camping there as well as everything else along the Murrindal River. And uh, we actually camped right by where, the, um, where that spring comes out into the river. Um, it is the most mysterious place because we didn't even know there were caves there we just went camping and all of a sudden we were falling down all sorts of things i'm very interested given the amount of transformation that's happened here in victoria and that's really evidenced by what you've shown us there in that um, in that presentation the limestone deposits i mean presumably that's come from you know, a um uh, an ocean floor at some particular point um, the limestone itself yeah so the limestone is um early devonian there, so um, it's Paleozoic. It's yeah. hundreds of millions of years old. And there it is at the top of a mountain, basically. It is, that's right. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Any other questions we have in the audience? There's one. I know this guy. Yes, I, I was going to ask in terms of cave formation, because I've, I've sort of wandered around Carlsbad caverns. They've got some other caves that they don't let tourists into because they're, they're quite nasty caves and they're formed by a, a different process. I thought they had something to do with sulfuric acid. Um, yeah, so at Carlsbad Caverns, you're right. Um, the evidence there is that there's been sulfuric acid coming up from depth. So there are um, deposits of native sulphur in some of those caves, as well as a lot of gypsum calcium sulphate. Um, so they form by a different process again. And there's nothing like that around um, Australia? There's no evidence of sulfuric acid formation um, like that anywhere in Australia. It's possible some of the South Australian caves, um, which are maize caves, might have formed next to um, sulphide mineral deposits because when the sulphide minerals are weathered, they release um, sulphuric acid. So it's possible, but we haven't been able to prove that. Thank you very much. Remarkable. I want to pick you up also. Uh, there's a question here first. Okay. Richard. Thanks, Mike. John, uh, excuse a dumb question from a civil engineer. I was impressed by the complexity of some of the mapping. God help us, it's hard enough to do surveying on the surface of the Earth. How, how do you go about surveying underground, or are the, is there just a lot of by guess and by God in those um, 
so th the old cave maps and the smaller caves are done with a, a tape uh, and a compass and a clinometer um, and just from point to point and then sketching in the walls in between. Um, there are these new systems now where you can take in the larger caves. Um, one of my students just did it for a cave. He takes in something that um, his is an infrared system and it's like a nodding head that goes up and down as you walk through the cave and it shoots out infrared in every direction. And it, um, at the end of just walking through the cave and back again, it constructs a three-dimensional map of the inside of the cave. It's extraordinary. You made an offhand comment at the beginning and you talked about the, the enhanced dissolution of limestone where fresh water and seawater meet. I'm interested in that because I've seen some examples of that on the coast in the Calcaronites, even yeah. areas, areas in it and places like that where you get that ridge and runnel on the foreshore. Is that, yeah. What's the chemistry behind that? Um, it's, um, even though both of them can be saturated with respect to calcite, um, when you mix them together, um, the mixing curve, it's a curved line. And so if you have two points on either side right. and mix them, they form a straight line and it drops below the saturation line. Um, it's due to the actual, um, it's a chemical thing. I wish I'd known that 30 years ago. I might've got a paper out of it. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Any probably, other questions? Still can. I do have probably, probably still can, actually. I do have another question because no one's putting their hand up, but do put it up if you do have one. Um, we've got sea level rise on our hands. Um, so yeah, we hear from David Carolee, we've got a good few hundred years of sea level rise locked in no matter what we do at this point. Uh, what's that mean for the Nullarbor and the, um, and the caves down, the, down by the ocean? Well, um, the sea level rise that he's talking about is only pretty small. So um, we're talking about, you know, a metre, two metres. Um, in terms of the cave development on the um, row plane, that might um, move them up a metre or two, which would certainly be significant for them. Mm. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, David Moore would like to know, how far west does the Kosciuszko uplift go? So this can be a bit controversial, but um, I see good evidence of it in Western Victoria. Really? Yeah. What, uh, give us some evidence. Um, so um, if you look at the Brisbane Ranges, uh -huh. so the, the Brisbane Ranges have actually got a flat top on them, mm. which is the... Um, Miocene sea floor, which you can then match on the other side. So there's um, a good 200 metres of uplift there. Okay, so there's tertiary on top of the... Okay, yep. okay, on top of the block. And one more, Benji would like to know, what advice would you give for people wanting to start out caving? <laughs> Be very careful. Uh, um, <laughs> so uh, go caving with a recognised group. Um, they'll look after you and s stop you doing stupid And there's things. a number of those. There are. So Victorian Speleological Association in Victoria. Um, there are also um, good groups associated with scouts and uh, a number of others as well. Um, if he wants to get in contact with me, I can put him in contact with them. That's a bit of good advice. Is there another question? Yes, mm -hmm. gentlemen here. You sort of intimated uh, time frame for Chilligoe. Uh, how does that compare with the oldest caves in Australia? Yes, so I don't know exactly when the Chiligo Caves formed, but I presume it's once the monsoon became established. So if we knew for sure the monsoon started 30 to 40 million years ago, then I would think the Chiligo Caves and the other caves across northern Australia started forming then, and that would make them the oldest. Um, well, let me go back one step. Um, at Janolan, um, there's um, some discussion about whether there are in fact um, clay deposits in there that formed in situ, and those are very old. In fact, I can't remember. Yeah, it might be 300 million. 300 million. Really? Yeah, so that one's a bit controversial because it's a bit hard to tell the difference between a clay mineral that's formed in the cave compared to one that's been washed in. So there'd be no problem washing in 300 million year old clay. Um, forming it in situ in the cave is another matter. So if that's true, then the Janolan Caves are the oldest. Another question that it, you would expect, it, is there widespread evidence of indigenous occupation of caves in Australia? Because I know in elsewhere in the world, caves are widely used by indigenous peoples. Is that the case in Australia? Um, not so much. Um, in general, um, 
indigenous people used overhangs as campsites and sometimes went a bit deeper into the caves. Um, the only one that I know of where they went quite a long way into the cave is Kunalda on the Nullarbor, um, where they went well into the dark zone there to mine the flint nodules in the walls um, um, to get the flint for artefacts. And how did the Thylacoleos get in the caves? Did they fell in in the dark? Or? They fell in, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Didn't help either, did it? No, never mind. Is there another question from the audience here? Yes, at the back. So, um, I'm pretty interested in cave and geology. I'm just wondering, would you have any advice for taking these as a future career, you know, as a future job? Um, so, there are plenty of jobs in geology. Um, the numbers of students taking geology at university courses has dropped over the years and there's a continuing demand for geologists in all sorts of um, places. So um, some of it's in the extractive industries like uh, on mine sites, they all need geologists, um, but also planning uh, in um, government departments and environmental geology, looking at water, groundwater, things like that. Um, there's plenty of options for jobs with, for geologists. Um, I should go back to that answer I gave previously about the animals falling in. Um, in some cases, it looks like they might have been using the caves as dens, right. um, but uh, in other cases, you can see there are pit traps that um, animals have fallen down into. Mm. Can I introduce uh, Dr. Susan White, who's the Deputy Chair of the Victorian Division of the Geological Society of Australia, to propose uh, a vote of thanks to John. <coughs> Well, it is of great pleasure that I've been able to uh, listen to John yet again, because I've known John for very many years, uh, and we've worked together for quite a number of years as well. Um, and as usual, he has managed to produce a most fascinating and interesting discussion, uh, show, uh, showcasing really four of the main areas of caves in Australia, but indicating, of course, that they are just a sample of what, what we've got in Australia. A lot of people think that Australian caves are a bit, you know, ho-hum and we haven't got very many. We may, we do have quite a lot and they're really very fascinating and I'd really like to thank John very much for his fascinating talk. <laughs>